Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We are here to worship and we're going to start this morning with what a mighty God we serve. So as Thomas comes forward, if you could please look on the screen and if you need your hymnals, page number 672. Please stand. What a mighty God we serve. Hymn number 149, hymn number 149, and there is, I believe, if I remember, a clap in that one as well, so please be ready for it. I'm a little slow getting there. Ah, Lord God. Now, I do have to tell you a quick story, and I've told this before. We're not going to do it now, because I'm older, and you don't want to hurt me. There's, this song, when it was, these guys were younger and stuff, we would do things like, our Lord God. Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. And it would get a little bit rough. But it was in fun. Outstretched. Outstretched arm. Yes. yes. Outstretched arm. So the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is something that we ought to carry with us all the time. And if you've walked in here this morning with burdens, and we all have them. If you walked in here this morning with brokenness, and we all have them, be reminded that the blood of Jesus Christ binds up the brokenhearted and brings joy to those who are in sorrow. This song talks about that power and that love. So let's sing it and just enjoy it with one another. Our Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy great power. Our Lord God, Thou hast Heavens and the earth with an outstretched arm. And no, nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Great and mighty God, great and count so mighty is he. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Try that again. Our Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy great power. Our Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth with an outstretched arm. And nothing is too difficult for Thee. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Great and mighty God, great and out so mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Father in heaven, thank you that we acknowledge you alone are sovereign and nothing, nothing is too difficult for you. Not the world we live in, not the political situation we find ourselves in, not the brokenness in our personal lives, nothing is too difficult that the blood of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit cannot bring about peace that passes understanding. This morning, to you be glory. Amen. 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 Please be seated. We have a number of uh, announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, a quick reminder, if you have children in your household or grandchildren, um, at each door each week is children's bulletins. Now, our little ones are off at Kids Quest and they're doing their Bible focus for their age group. But what a wonderful thing it would be for parents and grandparents to, to grab a children's bulletin each week when they're here, bring it home, and sometime during the week do the fun activities. Now, some of them are really easy. Some of them are but what a wonderful experience that would be 
with a, with a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, or a child that has been placed in your care. And you, you do something that deals with the, the sermon and the, the theme of the worship that happened on Sunday, and you are extending that in your life throughout the week. We really shouldn't need a children's bulletin to do that in this world. But what a great tool that would be to share the love of Christ. So I encourage you to think about the children's bulletins that are uh, at the doors each week. We need your prayer. I'll talk more about this a little bit later when it comes to the time of uh, uh, tithes and offerings. Um, this happens to be a food box that one of the uh, fathers in Trail Life, who's one of the leaders, put together for the boys. And the boys helped uh, put it together as well. But this weekend is our camp out, our first camp out for our boys program. And uh, we need your prayer. It's been great weather so far this season. I am praying it's not 25 degrees. Um, this is kindergarten through fifth grade boys and their dads. And we are looking forward to just a wonderful time of fellowship and Christ-centered, uh, just being men and boys together. That can get derailed pretty quickly. So pray that God sets up a weekend of ministry. Um, Operation Christmas Child, you're going to almost get tired of me bringing this up, but we don't have that many more weeks left. Um, please, please, if you or your families or uh, friends of your families say, you know what, my church is doing something. You want to join with me? I had an email recently sent to me of a lady who went on one of the trips to deliver these. And we almost kind of think it's a cutesy thing, you know, giving presents to kids at Christmas time. Her description of how it brings together the churches in different countries and in communities even in the United States and pastors and elders and how the fellowship of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ works together and gathers the children of a village or a town or a community. And then not only shares them this gift, but shares with them the true and greatest gift, the gift of Jesus Christ. And this lady has been part of Operation Christmas Child, just like we have been for years and years and years. But being on the front lines and seeing lives changed and watching those children sit with wide eyes and listening to the gospel message of Christ, she said, this is far more a ministry than I ever thought it was. You're part of that. So pray about it and, and see if you can encourage others to participate. Even if you and I can't go on all these trips, you and I can still support the hands and feet and voice of Christ around the world. This coming Saturday is our men's breakfast Bible study. Um, it's actually in the bulletin twice for the following Saturday as well, and it's not. It's the first and third Saturday of, of each month. And I have a quick story to tell about that. Well, I got lots of stories this morning. I'm sorry. I'm at my store, and there's this little old man by the name of Lou. And Lou has been to our church a number of times, years ago for one of our Christmas programs, and recently for a couple of the community luncheons. Now, I've been after Lou for, for three, four years. Well, there's a gentleman in our church by the name of Bruce who seems to show up in all the oddest places at the oddest times. And he's been coming to the store on a pretty regular basis now, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to say good morning to me, and I find that interesting. And uh, he's built this friendship with Lou. Well, the other day, Lou sat me down and said, you know what? If for some reason Bruce stops coming, Jim, I had a stroke and I don't remember things well. I really want to get more involved with going to the community luncheons and the men's breakfast Bible study, which he's never been at. And I need reminders. And Bruce has been great at reminding me. Could you continue reminding me? The reason I bring that story up is this. Are you making it your personal walk and mission each day to be what Christ calls you to be? Lou was crying out. Now, I've reminded him and told him stuff for years. I had heard that he had a stroke, but I didn't realize that his memory was at such a point. 
And he's so grateful for Bruce and his life right now. Almost every morning they sit and have a cup of coffee and they talk about all kinds of stuff. And I, they giggle in the corner like two little kids. And he's fearful that if Bruce should, you know, move his life around and go some other place in the morning, that he's going to lose a connection. Well, are there people like that in your life that you can lovingly encourage, maybe for two, three, four years, before you see any fruit? Don't give up. Be who Christ has called you to be. Open arms. This Saturday, Men's Breakfast Bible Study. On the 13th, two weeks from now, uh, we have a very full weekend. And it is going to be a spaghetti supper here at church and an auction, which is a fundraiser for the boys and the girls program. And that Sunday, the boys and their dads are going to be here because we're celebrating them on Trail Life Sunday here in our congregation. Well, I don't know what it's going to be. I have no clue how it'll turn out. My last story or thing to share is what happened this Friday night. This Friday night was our great pumpkin party. And I'm in Walmart and I'm shopping for the candy and the basket's pretty full, pretty full. And a lady looks at me and I have my, one of my ties on, I believe in Jesus, and I don't know which tie I had on. And she's like, what are you doing? And you have to realize this lady had in her basket some costumes and some candy and, and I said, well, our church is having a great pumpkin party on Friday night. A church ought not celebrate the devil's day. And I agree with her, by the way. Yeah. I very much agree with her. My children still yell at me because they never went trick-or-treating in their life. Thomas is giving me an evil glare at the moment. Um, I was never much as a young adult and a father for Halloween because of that. And well, I did look at the lady and kind of said to myself, do I point out she has costumes and candy in her cart as she's telling me this, or do I ignore it? And I just smiled, and I said, well, in Christ we are called to sanctify the world around us. And the theme of the night is 1 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And if the children learn that lesson, it'll be a good night. Ten minutes later, as I'm in line, she happens to be the person behind me. And she's like, you know what this guy is doing? And she's all excited. So I don't know what happened in that ten minutes. Friday night comes. We're supposed to start at 6.30. Well, at 6.30, there's about 20 children and five families. And I said, Lord, okay, if this is who you bring to us, praise God, we're going to have a great night. I will tell you, there's the human side of me that got a little, well, numbers, and that's wrong. It should be, if one child came, I should have had joy in my heart. And I need to seek God's forgiveness, because sometimes I still fall into that terrible thing of numbers being success or failure. And the night started, and one by one, parents and kids started arriving. Miss Phyllis, who's part of our church, Phyllis, English, uh, Phyllis Christensen, at the end of the night, she goes, do you realize you had almost 100 kids here? Do you realize there was well over 60 adults here? Do you realize that when we had that gospel message talking about Jesus, there was silence in the room and everyone was listening? What a great night. That is because for weeks you've been praying. That is because Satan cannot stand against the power and light of Jesus Christ. When we are faithful, that's what happens. At the end of our service is our newsletter today. Please make sure that you grab a newsletter. It lets you know stories like that and things that are going on in our church community. Are there any other announcements this morning? Anything for Upward? Jamie? Amen. And, and I shared with Jamie, I'm at the store and a guy walks in and he goes, Upward basketball is happening this year, right? Because again, COVID canceled it. 
what a blessing that it's starting. Let's just pray for a moment. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that you care about people and not programs. We thank you for the blessings of ways to work through things, but if tra trail life, if, if upward should not exist five years from now and is replaced with something else, so be it. Lord, we care about people coming to know Jesus Christ and living for you. So Lord, give us that wisdom. To you be glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. In the front of your hymnals is our confession of faith this morning. And so I'm going to ask that you remain seated. But if you would turn there or look on the screen, it may be there as well. It is the Apostles' Creed. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Or to... Oh, very good. All right. Together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing together. Page 199, King of Kings. Let the 
Our final song for our time of praise this morning is Sing Alleluia. Thomas was reminding us with, with this motion that um, Alleluia is a special word. It means to praise God. We can praise Him with our voice. We can praise Him with the attitudes of our heart. We can praise Him with the actions of our lives. But God lives in the praises of his people. It brings joy to his heart. This is a serious kind of worship song. And so, right before we sing, we're just going to quiet our hearts for a moment and just have a few moments of silence. We're going to sing this song a cappella. Thomas may or may not decide to do a round portion of it. Do it. And, uh, and if he does, I would like some people to probably join with him. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Sing hallelujah to the Sing hallelujah. I encourage you to turn in your pew Bibles to Mark chapter 8 for our New Testament passage. Just two very short verses, verses 31 and 32. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. I'm Matthew saying that's not the verse I picked. Pray for me a special prayer. My dyslexia is kicking up because it's been a very long weekend and numbers and words are bouncing around on the page like you would not believe. Mark 31, chapter 8, verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And being rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed 
and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The point of our New Testament passage, along with the Old Testament, which we'll read in just a moment this morning, is what did Peter just do? Jesus shared a truth. And Peter said, don't say that, Lord. Peter began to rebuke Jesus. Oh, whoa, think about that for a moment. Here is one of the disciples. Here is one of the followers of Christ rebuking Christ in a sense. Lord, don't do that. Don't say that. And in a few moments, you're going to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament focuses this morning are going to say that not always are the bad things that we're doing for bad intentions. Jesus was loved by Peter, but Peter was wrong. Often, children of God, often believers in Jesus Christ, will do things they ought not do, not for bad reasons. They don't know the truth. They haven't looked deeply. They haven't discerned. They haven't asked the Holy Spirit to open their hearts and their minds and their eyes. Peter was wrong. Jesus, no, don't tell us that you're going to die. Don't tell us that you're, you're going to suffer. He was wrong. And yet his heart was still in a good place. How many of us and then later in the message, you're going to see where this leads. How many of us perhaps vote in the wrong direction and have unleashed in our culture, politically, in our government, things because we have voted for the wrong people, but our hearts were in the right place? How many of us support businesses or practices that do not honor God? But we thought we were doing something okay. How many of us in the way we raise our children in discipline or the lack of discipline, and it's because we love them, but we have created perhaps a monster. It's not always that our hearts are in the wrong place. Peter's heart was not in the wrong place. He did not know the truth. He did not know the wholeness of God's will and word. And this morning we're going to see something very similar in our story. We've been working through Elijah and Elisha and passing on the mantle of the Lord. We've been working through a series of Elijah and Elisha and now not just Receiving and passing on, but that receiving, that taking that mantle of the Lord upon ourselves as Elisha did. And there's a minor story found on page 394, 2 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse 38. And I want you to listen to these two stories that are put together. And then we'll truly start our message this morning. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, where there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Set up a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds. And he came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were. And they poured out some of it for the men to eat. But while they were eating the stew, they cried out, O oh, man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. He said, Then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, Pour some of it out for the men that they might eat. There was no harm in the pot. A man came from Baal Shizla, bringing to the man of God bread from the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, fresh ears of grain in his sack. And Elisha said, Give it to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, How can I set this before a hundred men? 
So he repeated, Give them to the men, that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. Father, we ask in the next few minutes as we spend together in your word, looking at what you have shared with us by the gift of your Holy Spirit, may our hearts be touched, may our minds be touched, may our lives be touched, may we be changed more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, that we might go from this place and be your image bearers in a dark world. Amen. Amen. Today is October 31st. Now, even though, as a child, I got to go trick-or-treating. My mom would dress me up. I was actually taught something a little more about today, that today was Reformation Day. And that was a day to be proud of. If you ask the average person in the average church today about October 31st, and you would say it's Reformation Day, most of them would be like, what? What are you talking about? Reformation Day simply is this. It was a day in which... On the door of a church, a whole set of challenges for a debate were nailed by Martin Luther. And they were challenges, and it was a normal thing. It was normally done in, in the cities of Europe. It was a normal thing that if you wanted to have a public debate about something, if you wanted people to, to gather and to, to wrestle and struggle over ideas so that you could grow and become more who God wants you to be, you do that together. And so here are my challenges. And Martin Luther, the founder of the Reformation, basically the father of the Reformation, was beginning to struggle with his church, was beginning to struggle with the culture he found himself in. Because what he started doing was he started reading the Bible. He started in prayer, being led by the Holy Spirit to understand what he was reading. And Martin Luther, as he was reading God's word and looking at his church and looking at the culture around him, started to say, we've got this wrong. God's word teaches some things very clearly, and we are living in a way that is very clearly not God's will. And he wanted to challenge the community. Now, I've shared with you often that I love to hate to listen to a radio station. And I say it that way, I love to hate to, because when I listen to it, my blood pressure does go up. I disagree with them on 99.9% .9 of everything they say. But I love to listen to it because I want to understand why they think what they think, how they think what they think, so that I might be able to be more informed in sharing with them the truth found in God's word. It's public radio. Well, Martin Luther was doing the same thing. He was challenging those who thought about things, those who wanted to debate. We often call Halloween the devil's day, and we should because it is a dark day that our culture certainly celebrates. If you do not think that there are spiritual forces at work, not just on October 31st, then you are not reading your word. You are not into God's word. You are not reading and understanding. Christianity did a wonderful job of, in the springtime, turning pagan holidays to focus on the resurrection of Christ. Easter has a pagan name. But most people, if you ask what is the real reason behind Easter, they'll get around to the resurrection of Jesus. We've done a great job of turning around a pagan holiday on December 25th, and we've even got the name of Jesus in it, Christ. We've done a bad job with Halloween. Did you know Halloween, the word means holy evening? And it was a name that the church came up with because they wanted to somehow point this pagan time, this pagan day in the direction of Christ. Much of this morning's message is about sanctification. Much of this morning's message is about taking the poison in the pot and being purified by the Holy Spirit. 
to being something that's nourishing. Much of this morning's message is acknowledging that our God can and our God is able and our God will, when we are willing, to go from poison to peace. To go from little, like those couple loaves of bread, to plenty. To go from weakness to strength. Our God can, but our God wants to use his people. Our God wants to have faith in his people. Martin Luther realized that. Martin Luther challenged his community. Real fast, what was some of Martin Luther's challenges? Well, the church at the time, and there was one church, so it's our church. The church of Jesus Christ at the time had stepped away from the fullness of the gospel. And they were saying things like, yeah, Jesus died for you, but you have to do these things in order to be saved. You have to give so much money, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. And it was kind of a works righteousness, not kind of, it was a works righteousness. There is nothing that you have to do to earn your salvation. It is earned for you completely on the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is where Martin Luther really, really struggled. And if you've ever heard of the five solos, the sola gratia and sola scriptura, Martin Luther said solo meaning only, only by grace are we saved, the gift of Jesus, not by our works. Only in God's word is there authority, not in the authority of a man or an elder or a pope or a pastor or a priest. The authority rests in God's word alone. And these were the things that he wanted to debate because people were struggling with that. They had raised themselves in a culture. They had been raised in a culture that taught them so many things. They had learned, well, if I am a good person, I will be allowed to go to heaven. If I'm good enough, if I go to church enough, if I give enough money, no. Martin Luther said, no, that's poison in the pot. Back to our Old Testament story for just a moment. Catch the setting. First of all, Gilgal. We've studied Gilgal already because if you remember that road trip that Elijah took Elisha on before Elijah was taken up to heaven, they started at Gilgal and, and, and they, they, they went to, to Bethel and to Jericho. And, well, Gilgal is that place that every Jewish person remembers. Joshua and the children of Israel crossing over the Jordan and setting up the 12 stones so that everybody would remember God's faithfulness and God's power and that God is the one who does it all. That's Gilgal. This is where Elisha goes. And who does he meet with? He meets with the believers. The culture has just come out of Ahab and his children political leaders that had destroyed the godly culture of Israel. Elijah had struggled with, with Ahab for years and years and years. We've been preaching on that for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the culture has fallen away from the worship of the one true God. The culture has fallen away. God's people, the children of Israel, were not living according to God's will. But Elisha is going to a place that is known for remembering God. Set up the 12 stones, teach your children, remember that God is the one who brings us along, brings us through the rivers of life. And he meets with the sons of the prophets. That's just a neat term for people whose heart was still connected to God. He was meeting with brothers, and perhaps sisters, but brothers and sisters in Christ of the Old Testament, brothers and sisters who had not bent their knee before Baal, brothers and sisters who still remembered who Yahweh was. And one of them sees that the servant of Elisha has set up a stew pot, and he goes up into the mountains, into the woods, and he starts collecting things. So there's a famine in the land. There's not a lot of food. And here we are having this fellowship time, and we're going to have something to eat. And with good intentions, this believer, this son of the prophets, this church member, went up into the woods and got a lap full of wild gourds and cut them up and threw them in the stew pot. 
He didn't really know what he was doing. He thought it would be okay. He thought it was good. His heart was not evil. And as they sat and began to eat, they realized perhaps the taste, perhaps they began to feel a little woozy. I don't know what it was that woke them up. But they realized there's death in the pot. There's poison in the pot. Oh man of God, Elisha, we are done for. There's poison in the pot. We're going to die. Get some flour. Some bread of life. Get some flour. Throw it in there. Stir it up. Let's sanctify this. And let's have our meal. Where am I going with this? The road to hell is often paved with good intentions. There's a phrase that I would imagine, especially the older people in this room, myself included, will, will remember. Ignorance is no excuse. We live in a world right now that so many things are going on. I am challenging you not to be apathetic. I am challenging you not to be uninformed. This Tuesday is election day. It's not an election day for a president. It's not election day for, for governors or senators or congressmen. But it's an election day. And there are things on the ballots, and, and I will not tell you, I don't think it's appropriate from the pulpit, especially in our culture, I don't think it's appropriate to say who you should vote for and give you a name and things like that. But it is every bit important and appropriate for the pulpits of Jesus Christ in churches to challenge you, are you voting according to your faith, and are you informing yourselves in such a way that you vote your values? You vote what you believe. You vote what you believe God's word teaches you. If you do not do that, you have neglected your responsibility. Now you can't yell at me for saying, well, you said Democrat, you said Republican, you said Libertarian. I'm not saying that. I really do believe in Jesus Christ, we have freedom. I really do believe that in Jesus Christ, each of us are responsible someday as individuals to stand before the throne of, of our God and make an accounting for what we've done. And you and I might see things differently. And maybe you're right, and maybe I'm wrong. If you want to know who I think you should vote for, talk to me after the worship service. I'll give you an earful. But the reality is, why do you vote and do you vote? Because you have a responsibility. There is poison in the pot. This individual, with good intentions, did something. And it brought death into the midst of God's people. There are politicians and there are proposals in our voting right now that will be on the back of your ballots. There are individuals who, whether they are doing things for evil intent or they think it's okay. <laughs> Through the Holy Spirit, do you discern that's poison? I'll give you an example. I might get a little trouble, but not too much. In that big, big, big bill that they've been fighting over in Washington, which you and I right now have very little say or power over because those are individuals we've already voted into office. There was, and I'm just going to give one example of many, why that particular bill has a lot of poison in it. If a single mom who has children, that makes a mom, were to get married, if that bill goes through, she will be charged twice the amount of taxes she would have been charged if she gets married. I'm going to. Here's a single mom who right now is being charged $1,200 in taxes. If she were to get married, 
That'll double. Now that bill, I hope, I pray, the intent wasn't, let's keep her single. Let's keep her not a married, committed family. I pray that wasn't the intent. Whether the, the writer of that bill made that the intent or not, but it's wiser for her financially not to get married. My point, what are the consequences of the laws that we write? What are the consequences of the beliefs that we put on paper in our culture and that we support? This morning I was sharing with my daughter a little bit about today's message and she laughed. She goes, it happened to actually be Marge, your granddaughter. Your granddaughter was talking to Hannah and said, you know what? My husband and I, we did it all wrong. We should have never gotten married. I should have claimed all these five little kids as a, as a single mom and we would be making out great. Because our culture right now is not supporting marriage, is not supporting husbands and wives and family. Whether it's intentional or not, there are individuals, I firmly believe, who are being led by demonic forces and Satan himself, and they're doing it on purpose. But I also believe, like the man in this passage, there are people who are blind, who are good intentions, and they're, 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 they're passing laws and doing things, not because they are evil at heart, we all are, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, if my memory serves correct. But that doesn't change the fact that if we do not come before the Lord in prayer, seek the leading of the Holy Spirit, look deeply into his word, find what his word says and what his will is, we may be adding poison to the pot. I'll use a different example now. And I'm not going to say good or bad. I'm just going to simply throw out some names of companies. Chick-fil-A. I have certain opinions about them because they've made stances on things. Now, not all my examples are going to be bad, as you're noticing. Disney. Hobby Lobby. Burger King. To what extent do I support? To what extent do I not support? To what extent do I financially encourage and help by, by buying things and encouraging by being one of their customers? To what extent do I step back? Man, those are deep personal decisions. But do you look into it? Do you think about it? The problem of this individual was not that he was, I am going to poison people. The problem of this individual was he didn't think about it. He was apathetic. It wasn't important enough for him to research, to ask, to say to everybody else, do you guys know what this is? Do you think we should eat it or not? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read the passage. Paul says something to the church, speaking to Timothy. For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, Always be sober-minded, enduring, suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. My friends, why do we do what we do? Are we apathetic and saying, this is too complicated? I'll throw another one back to the political arena for just a moment. Let's say there was an individual that I could vote for, and I know that financially 
it would be to my benefit. Everything that person says to me, it's going to help my pocketbook. But I also know what they stand for. I also know other things that they propose, other things that they want to happen in our culture. And I know those things are against God and wrong. But I'll make out better. Then I would be in sin for voting for that person. I would be, I should not vote my pocketbook. And we all know that that's normally what people are doing. Well, I make out better. The real question ought to be in my faith as a believer in Jesus Christ, when I raise my children, when I go to work, when I support institutions and businesses in our culture, and when I vote on a voting day, is am I ushering in the kingdom of Jesus Christ? That ought to be my question. I might make out far better financially. I might make out far better Influentially, I might make out far better in fame and fortune if I don't follow the ways of the Lord. Maybe I believe that. But this is not the world I live for. And this is not the world that I am accountable to. I am accountable to the throne that Jesus sits on. And if that is truly what I believe, that who I vote for does matter, and why I'm voting for that person also matters. What businesses I support and financially encourage, it matters. How I raise my children, whether I discipline or don't discipline, and it's not always from an evil intent. That man did not have an evil intent. He wanted to help feed everybody. That sounds great. I do not think all of our politicians are automatically evil. I do not think that all of our business leaders are automatically evil. And I don't think that every parent who, when I watch them, and they don't discipline the way they ought to, I don't think they're automatically evil. But I do think that they are often making decisions that have not been led by the Holy Spirit. I don't think that I know that. My friends, have you been lulled, as I have at many times, into an apathetic attitude? Oh, it doesn't matter. That's too much work to study and learn about companies and, and, and their perspectives on culture and what they're doing. Oh, it's too much work to learn about politicians and the positions they take. Oh, it's too much work to, to really ground my child because then I've got to stay home. It's too much work to say no to my child because then in the store they're going to throw a temper tantrum. Oh, that's, I just want peace. Who could be upset about that? When I'm shopping with my child, I just want a peaceful experience. I want, okay, I'll just give it to you because if I say no, you'll cry. You and I know that those kinds of things are wrong. And yet, how often do we get lulled into it? Either because of our personal attitudes of just, I don't want to deal with the problems. Or apathy, we don't want to really work at it. Our passage, we read in Timothy, that there is a time, and I'm going to tell you right now, the time is now. Paul was talking to Timothy, quite honestly, about false doctrine, and I'll share a little bit about that for just a moment. There are doctrines within the church that, on the surface, don't seem like such a huge, big deal. But when you plant them like a seed and they, they start to take root, it's a weed that begins to infest the body of Christ. I'll give one little example. The church, early church, 
soon after Jesus struggled whether or not Jesus was fully man, fully God, mostly man, mostly God, whether he really had a body or not. One of the, the struggles in the New Testament was against something called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics believed that Jesus did not have a physical body, that he looked like he did, but he didn't have a physical body. And, and they were buying into the culture of the day, which was a Greek mindset. And Paul rails into that. If Jesus truly did not die on the cross, if he didn't have a body that truly died and was buried and was raised to a new life again, then we ought to be pitied. Because we have the confidence that we will have a resurrection because Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. Now on the surface, if you were an early, early Christian in those early, early days of the emerging church and someone said to you, because it fit with your philosophy of the day, it fit with your culture, and they said to you, does it really matter whether or not God had a body or not, if he was fully physical and human? God loves you. Oh, that sounds good. He came to earth to share the good news. Wow, that sounds great. And bodies, they're dirty and, and, and sinful and the physical world is, is broken and God couldn't mingle with that. And a lot of Christians were falling into that false doctrine. And Paul jumps on that with, with wholehearted zeal as a pastor, as a preacher, as an elder, as an apostle and says, stop. False doctrines, when they're a little kernel, are going to grow and they are going to infest and infect the church. That's kind of what I'm talking about this morning. Do we struggle and wrestle with the decisions that we make? Do we struggle and wrestle with the theology that we carry? Do we struggle and wrestle with how we raise our children and discipline and, and teach with what companies we support and, and, and financially build because we are one of their customers on a regular basis? Do we struggle and wrestle with who we support politically? Because those things have an effect. And when the men sitting around that stew pot realized what was going on, they said there's death in the pot. There's poison in the pot. Man of God, we need God. And what does Elisha do? Elisha takes bread and flour, basically, and in and of itself, that's nothing. But it was a symbol of God. It was a symbol of the bread of life. It was a symbol of God entering into the mix. We as believers, when we enter as a believer, fully understanding who we are into the lives of our children, it will have an effect in the way we raise them. It's called sanctification. It's called living by the Spirit of God. When we live in this culture and go to baseball games and football games and when we go to businesses and support them, if we believe, bring our faith and our beliefs and we carry them fully, we don't leave them home, we go to these places, we can be an agent of sanctification. When we vote, and we write letters and call our congressmen and our congressladies and our senators and those who sit in office and we let them know what we believe and if you are going to continue to go in this direction, I'm not voting for you. Then we will be instruments like that flower was in God's hand to sanctify the world that we live in. But it's so much easier not to worry about it. It's so much easier, it's so much easier not to bother. My friends, if those men sitting around that pot tasted something a little off, and they said, you know what, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm just gonna sit nice and quiet. You know, that guy was with good intentions gathering those, those gourds up in the backcountry. I don't want to offend my brother in Christ. I don't want to offend somebody, so I'm not going to say anything. There's poison in the pot, and I know it, but that'll ruffle some feathers. 
at the end of the day, there would have been some dead followers of God sitting around that campfire. Are we as a church willing to let people die around us because we're afraid to offend? Man of God, there is death in the pot. We need God to intervene. We need something to happen. And Elisha did, and it was sanctified. Are you willing to be instruments of sanctification in this culture by being used by the Spirit of God to make change happen? In families, in businesses, in politics, if not, then I wonder if you're reading God's word. As a very minor point this morning, that second story, the first major emphasis of that first story that we just looked at was God can take what is poison and purify it. God can. He wants you to be part of that. The second story was this man who comes from an obscure little city. That obscure city, by the way, the, the name of the city just simply means Lord of Three. Whatever that means, another discussion for another day, not the main point of today's message. And this man comes from this, this obscure city and he brings his offering of first fruits. Now, one thing that we want to get out of that story that's being told in God's word is, wait a minute, in Leviticus, you are commanded to bring the offering of first fruits, and this man's heart was so on fire for God, he was looking for where God was to give it to God. And it wasn't at the temple anymore. It wasn't any other place than except for where the word of God was, and that was Elisha. By right, that first fruit offering should have gone to the temple. Remember what was going on at the temple with with Ahab and his sons and, and false worship and idols being put up in God's temple. And so this follower who really had faith, where does he bring his first fruit offering? It wasn't to the house of the Lord where it should have gone because God's house had been turned into something different. The offering that he was commanded to bring, he looked for, where is God? Where is God's word? And he brought it to Elisha. It wasn't a big offering. It was these loaves of bread, little loaves and some grain. And there's a famine. And we had our stew pot already. That God took the poison and purified. God sanctified. But the men are still hungry. There's over a hundred. And Elisha says to his servant, give it to the men. Boy, this sounds like Jesus is the feeding of the 5,000. It is certainly a precursor story that points to the wonder and beauty of Jesus Christ when he walked the earth. And Elisha says, feed it to the men. And, and the, the servant says, how can I do that? There's not a whole lot here. God says, give it to them and there'll be some left over. And sure enough, you see, our God has not only the ability to purify the poison, he has the ability to take what we think is small and make it magnificent and magnify it in a way that's wonderful. If you think that your vote isn't worth a whole lot, then you don't think your God has a whole lot of power. If you don't think your buying power is worth a whole lot, then you don't think your God has a whole lot of power. If you don't think your influence on your children and your grandchildren is that strong compared to the influence of the world, then you don't think your God has a whole lot of power. We have two stories today. And the one story is crying out and saying, God can take what is poison and purify it when God's people recognize it is poison and they cry out to God for direction. And the second story this morning says, you might not think you have a whole lot, but when you place it in God's hand, look out, Satan, you can't stand. You might not think you have a whole lot, but when you take what you have and put it in God's hand, Satan cannot stand. So this morning, are you ready to be led by the Spirit of the living God? 
Are you ready to pick up that mantle that was given first by Elijah and Elisha put on himself? Are you ready to wear the mantle of the Holy Spirit, the calling of the church of Jesus Christ? and enter into a world and to be willing like Martin Luther did on uh, October 31st and challenge the culture around them, him and us right now, to challenge our culture to wake up. Are you willing to be light and salt? Because if not, then the men around that pot are going to die. Our culture is not going to be touched by the grace of Jesus Christ. This morning, it's not my place to tell you who to vote for, how to raise your children, or what business to support, but it's certainly my place to challenge you. Do you think about it? Do you pray about it? Do you look into God's word to give you the direction? And when the Holy Spirit convicts you, of the sins of our culture, then are you willing to no longer be apathetic, but to be the body of Christ on the move? May you and I find ourselves willing to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to discern right from wrong, truth from lie. Father, we thank you for your word inspired by the Holy Spirit given to us to be the rule and authority, only authority for our lives. Lord, forgive us for where we have failed and Lord, we thank you for grace because that is the forgiveness we're praying for. And well up within our hearts, the commitment, the desire to be faithful in all you call us to do for the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. amen. Our song of response this morning, I'll ask that you please stand with me as we sing together hymn number 575. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, hymn number 575.
Hopefully, um, plywood and box just screwed together real quick because for that camp out, we are going to need some place to store the food so that the critters don't get into it. And so I knew this guy had some tools and whatever, and I said, hey, it'd be a great project for, for you and your small group of boys. There's five uh, fourth and fifth graders that get together on Friday night. And um, this Friday, he goes, oh, yeah, I put the box by the front entryway. And now you can take a look to see if you like it or not. And I walked out there and I was like, what in the world? Yeah. And I mean, oh. he's got a little cooler in here and, and, and a little drawer to put stuff. And I was, and, and so that it's not so heavy to carry, <laughs> he's got it on wheels so that we can pull it around. And it, it just reminded me of something. That giving to God is not money. Giving to God is not tithes and offerings of, of some church or some elder or some pastor saying, oh, we need your money. Giving to God comes from the wellspring of our hearts. And we have people in this church who are putting their gifts and their talents from Bruce and the pictures that are starting to beautify the, the church with messages of, of God's word to a father who loves the Lord and put his all into something, to school teachers who are teaching our children to, when we come to our ties of offerings, do not think of it as money. If God has blessed you and he's moved in your heart for you to be a blessing, fantastic. But there's far more, far deeper than finances. When we come to this time of tithes and offerings, ask that God opens your eyes and your, your mind to what it is that maybe you can give. Not necessarily to a church organization, but to the body of Christ, the ecclesia. How can you serve God? where your blessings are. We come before the Lord now to bring to him our hearts, our tithes, and our offerings.
that there are so many ways in which we can offer up to you a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord, accept these gifts that we bring before you today and use them that the light of Jesus Christ would go forth from this place on a camp out with us into our schools, into our workplaces, that the light of Jesus Christ would change the darkness into a place of light. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We continue this morning in our time of congregational prayer. Church. Good morning. How's the sound this morning, Don? Can you hear me now? Everything I say in canon will be held against me. Now. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this day and every day that you give us breath in our lungs to uh, give you honor, glory, and praise. That's the reason why we have breath in our lungs, is to worship you. Mm. And let's face it, if you're not breathing, nothing else really matters. So we ought to pray for the ministries that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in this church. It's almost like the church that never sleeps. Jim will give testimony for that next week after the camp out. But we pray for uh, people who are not here today, and we pray for the people that uh, may not be friends of this church. Mm. Yes, sir. The congregational families on the list this week are Tom and Teresa Phillips, Don Reinhardt, the Roberto family, Vinnie, Amanda, Magnus, Maddox, Carolyn, and Jesse. Ongoing prayers for May Lennon, Eleanor Ogden, Lorraine Otto Bergen, Scott Hill, Matt Kindoff, Norma Falker, Bob Norris, it would be wonderful if somebody would reach out, give them a call or send them a card. And prayers for people who are currently serving our country and, and the ones who have served our country, the veterans who make up a, a large percentage of our population. And the first responders who go out on calls that we pray that they get there safely to minister to the person who needs Jesus Christ. And prayers for my choice pro-life ministry. We know that uh, that's a very important ministry because every life is created in the image of God. So pray for that ministry that, that they get strength day to day and that they can help save lives. And the Pacific Justice Institute is an organization that helps fight our battles when we're wrongly charged with frivolous lawsuits that we can't fight on our own, but they pick up uh, their mantle and fight for us. And now I'd like to open up the floor for congregational prayers and concerns. Lord, I think of Tammy Pat Figger's daughter, who has pancreatic cancer. Mm. Lord, we ask.
ask that you would be the God of healing. And Lord, that in this situation, you would melt a hard heart. We ask that the wonder and beauty of Jesus Christ would be made manifest. Lord, we know that all things work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We know that what Satan means for our evil, you can turn around for our good. Father, not only Pat, but so many parents, so many of us cry out for our loved ones. May in these difficult situations, the truth of Jesus, the, the wonder of grace, touch the lives of those we love. Lord, I also lift up Cindy Ellison, who went to the hospital last night because her enzyme count, her electrolytes and things like that were all out of whack. And the doctors are seeking to help her and preserve her life. So as a church, we cry out for our sister. We ask that at this moment, your Holy Spirit would be so evident in that hospital room that she knows she is not alone, that she can reach out and simply hold on to you. And we ask, dear Lord, that as the great physician, you had already begun the miraculous work of healing her body. This we pray for your glory.
thank you so much for Jim Bronius. We know that this is Pastor Bruce Shaver's month, and we pray that we can say it and not just think it for all that he does for us. We thank you for him. I'd like to pray for Tony and Jen Potts. Jen is in the hospital with high blood pressure, and we're praying that she can get that under control so she can go back home. Yes. We thank the Lord for the many spiritual gifts that he's given this church, and the book of books the 1,189 chapters of the Old and the New Testament that give us the truth. And each Sunday we come here to be sanctified by that truth. And John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. And we know that nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible with God. Now, if there's no more prayers from the floor, I'd like to ask you to stand for the prayer that uh, Jesus taught his disciples when they came to him and they wanted to know, Lord, teach us how to pray. So we've memorized this prayer and we believe what it says. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hymn number 563, hymn number 563, open my eyes that I may see, and all the things that God has for me, open my eyes when I raise my children, when I work and I support a business, open my eyes that I might see when I cast my vote, Lord, your will, not mine. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my head the wonderful key that shall unpass and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God. Thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine, open my ears that I may hear voices of truth. Thou sentest clear, and while the wind notes fall on my ear, and
wants us to see. When our ears are opened, we learn from God what he wants us to know. But now it's time for our mouths to be opened and to share with a dark world the light that's shining through those windows, the beauty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and know that our sovereign God alone sits on the throne. Go in grace and peace and mercy. Amen. Amen. Amen.